Max found himself seated in the New York airport, a tinge of boredom creeping in at the notion of spending his evening there. His gaze fixated on the boarding process for the Charlotte-bound flight, silently wishing for a seamless journey ahead. A co-owner of a modest pharmaceutical enterprise established by their father, Max shared this venture with his two sisters. The company had thrived, propelled by a handful of invaluable yet underutilized medications crafted by their late father. Nonetheless, without their parental guidance, its growth trajectory appeared stunted. His stay in New York over the past few days had revolved around negotiations for the company's acquisition by a larger pharmaceutical conglomerate. Today marked the culmination of those efforts as Max and his team concluded the deal, dispatching the necessary paperwork to the lawyers for scrutiny. Despite yearning for a return home this evening, prospects seemed dim. The final flight to Charlotte stood fully booked, leaving Max relegated to the third spot on the waiting list. Uncertain of his next move, he hesitated to reach out to his wife, Camille, grappling with what words to convey. Sitting at the bar, he sipped his second gin and tonic, keeping his eyes on the gate. Thoughts of a lucrative deal and a significant amount of money that he and his sisters would soon split between them flashed through his mind. More than $10 million in generous compensation for the transition period at Big Pharma, that's what awaited him and his wife, Camille, in a new and better lifestyle. Their twin girls were already on their way to independence, both studying at Duke University, where the cost of tuition was already significantly affecting his finances. Everything was going to change as soon as the agreement with the pharmaceutical company was finalized. In the meantime, the boarding process was coming to an end, and staff at the exit were rushing the last passengers to board the plane. Suddenly, a happy accident happened. The boarding board suddenly switched, and Max's name appeared on the waiting list. Without hesitation, he threw several bills on the bar, said goodbye to the bartender, who gave him a thumbs up, grabbed his briefcase and suitcase, and rushed to the exit. An employee at the entrance handed Max a boarding pass and informed him that he and two other passengers had been upgraded to the category of seats vacated after a group of four people failed to show up for boarding. Excited, Max hurried down the aisle of the plane with his new companions and was pleasantly surprised to find that he got a seat in first class. Taking this as a good sign, he settled into his upgraded chair, grateful for the unexpected upgrade that would allow him to return home a day earlier than planned. When he boarded the plane, the door closed behind him, and the flight attendant offered him a drink while they were preparing for takeoff. Feeling that he deserved another drink, he drank a glass and fell asleep, imagining a luxurious future for himself and Camille. The jolt of landing brought him out of his sleep. When he reached the taxi stand, he decided to take a taxi and go home. A few days before, he had driven to the airport in his pickup truck. Feeling exhausted and slightly tipsy, he called Camille late to give him a ride. Their house was a few miles from Charlotte, so the taxi ride was long enough for him to doze off again. The driver had to wake him up on arrival. Max paid the fare, left a generous tip, and got out of the taxi listlessly. After a long, hectic day and evening, he longed to relax in bed with Camille when the taxi pulled away and he approached the house. He was struck by an unexpected sight a shiny gold Mercedes parked in front of his garage. He couldn't help but admire the stylish car, although, for him, all Mercedes were stylish. Darkness enveloped the house. The clock struck midnight, and Max froze in place. He was talking to Camille from the law office that day, and she didn't mention anything about late-night guests. Despite trying to push away the disturbing thoughts, he couldn't help but worry about what might be lurking in the shadows. Desperately clinging to the hope of a peaceful reunion with Camille, he headed for the door leading from the garage to the house, and his heart began to pound with fear and expectation. Unlocking the door, he entered the quiet house, walked with deliberate slowness through the kitchen, and up the stairs to the bedroom he shared with Camille. When he reached the bedroom, he found that the door was ajar, and it seemed that no one was expected here. He stepped inside, and the door closed behind him with a soft click. At that moment, everything seemed to freeze. My head went blank, my breath caught, and my heart began to pound. Camille was sleeping naked, sprawled on the bed and hugging a man who was also asleep and even slightly smiling in his sleep. Max froze in place, and time seemed to drag on endlessly. Finally, his mind began to function again. He looked at Camille's hand lying on the man next to her and the way they were both snoring softly. Sadness pierced Max's heart. Until now, he had found solace in Camille's gentle snoring, it seemed to Max that she almost purred when she snored. This sound made him feel calm and safe, it reminded him of the peaceful sleep they shared lying next to each other. 
but he knew that he would never hear that soothing sound again or feel her presence next to him. Despite his broken heart, Max began to get distracted from his thoughts when he noticed the neatly folded clothes of a man on a chair where Max always sat. Max felt rage flare up. Inside him. He quickly picked up his trousers, took out his wallet and car keys, but then hesitated. After thinking about it, he decided to take a tennis racket from the closet in the bedroom to fight back against the one who angered him. But he realized that cruelty would only lead to more trouble, both in the short and long term. A new thought occurred to him, he grabbed his phone to take some pictures while the idea was growing. When Max finished taking pictures, he packed up all the stuff. The man was much bigger than Max, he was four or five inches taller and weighed about fifty pounds more. Max hesitated, realizing that taking a tennis racket with him would not be the best solution. Clutching his clothes and shoes tightly, he looked at his wife, the woman he had loved for more than two decades and the mother of his beloved daughters. With a heavy heart, he began to struggle with the emotions that could overwhelm him. Without shedding a tear, he left the bedroom and went down the stairs to the exit. The familiar beep of the key fob announced the opening of the Mercedes doors. Max put his briefcase and suitcase in the car and then got into the driver's seat. Although he wasn't usually a fan of luxury cars, he liked the smoothness of the ride. After familiarizing himself with the controls, he turned on the gear and set off. After driving about a mile, Max stopped the car and examined the wallet of his wife's lover. Inside, he found the usual contents, some cash, business cards that identified the lover as Franklin Thompson, senior sales manager at a local Mercedes dealership, and a driver's license with an address in Charlotte. Max realized that. If he had relatives in Charlotte, he could cause trouble for them, and also perhaps for Camille. But feeling tired, Max decided to go to the nearest motel to get some sleep. Camille Tronder was known for her caution despite being inferior in intelligence to her husband, Max caution allowed her to remain in an affair with Franklin Thompson for almost five months, and Max did not find out about it. The next morning, lying in bed with Franklin, she couldn't help but compare him to Max. Although he was good in bed, he lacked the depth and connection she shared with her husband. She couldn't shake the feeling that he looked too much like a car salesman. Realizing this, she understood that it was time to end the affair. Franklin's sense of possessiveness became overwhelming, he insisted on spending the night with her. Although she allowed it this time, she knew it wouldn't happen again. She belonged to Max and could not accept the idea of another man in their marital bed. It seemed disrespectful to her, even if Max never found out about it. Later that day, she decided to call Franklin and end their romance with a gentle but firm conversation. Having made her decision, she headed for the shower. When she was done, she returned to the bedroom and began to dress, while Franklin came out of the shower wearing only a towel. Pausing for a moment, he asked Camille, where did you put my clothes? Confused, she replied, I didn't touch your stuff. Franklin explained, I left them folded on this chair, but they're gone. Maybe you put them in the guest room. Realizing his mistake, he muttered something under his breath and headed back down the corridor. A few minutes later, he returned empty-handed. No, there's nothing there, he muttered, trying to figure out where his clothes had gone. Camille, feeling impatient, suggested, maybe you left them downstairs when we came in last night after a lot of drinking. Franklin replied confidently, no, I'm sure I didn't, but I'll go check it out. With that, he left the bedroom and quickly returned, running up the stairs. Camille, Camille, my car is missing, my clothes are gone too. Someone must have been here last night and taken them away. What a horror! What's going on? Franklin exclaimed in disappointment. Excuse me, Camille said, trying to make sense of Franklin's words. How could his things disappear if we were together all night? Shocked, Camille collapsed onto the bed. Franklin asked, what happened? Trying to catch her breath, Camille tried to think of an answer. Franklin, what if it's Max, she managed to say. What if he came back from New York while we were sleeping? What if he took your stuff in car? Franklin, visibly shaken, collapsed onto the bed next to Camille. We have to find out where he is, he exclaimed. Maybe it's Max, but if he's still in New York, then someone else got into the house. We need to call the police. I need to pick up my things in the car. Although, no, the car situation is a problem. If we contact the police, they will ask about the ownership, which is registered in my wife's name. Just thinking about the possible consequences left him speechless. I will contact his office. 
his secretary usually arrives early in the morning and may know about his whereabouts, Camille said, picking up the phone and dialing Max's office number. Despite the early hour, Max's secretary immediately picked up the phone. Max TR's office, how can I help you? Camille expressed concern that there had been no news from Max the night before. Sheila assured her that it was still early and mentioned that the team in New York had been working late the night before, which was probably the reason for the delayed start of the working day. I talked to Max around 6 o'clock last night before heading home. He said that they have made good progress, and there is a possibility of a deal on the same day. This is great news. Max is still in New York, right? Yes, I think so. I expect to get a message from him as soon as they all get back to the lawyer's office. Would you like me to ask him to call you? Yes, please, but only if he has time because I understand the importance of this deal. Keep me informed. After finishing the conversation, Camille looked at Franklin and suggested calling 911 and reporting a break-in and carjacking since Max was still in New York. Franklin asked, what exactly should we tell the authorities? That Camille's lover had his clothes taken from his bedroom and his car stolen from the driveway, the situation seemed terrible. Camille offered to take Franklin home so he could change his clothes and then report the theft as if it had happened in his own home. They needed to figure out the situation quickly and come up with a plan while the wife was busy taking the children to school. I'm not going to talk about missing clothes because it may be more difficult to explain than a stolen car, but yesterday I told my wife that I would be in Atlanta for a meeting about the new Mercedes S-Class and would not return home until noon. I'll say that I left the keys in the car to pop into the salon, and when I returned, I found that the car had been stolen. It is quite possible that I can also say that I left my wallet in the car. Let's stay here for a couple of hours, who knows, maybe we'll need another show. Maybe together. What do you say? Okay, I'll call work and ask for sick leave. Camila worked as a paralegal at a small law firm. The work was tolerable, but as a rule, routine. After going out into the hallway to make a phone call, she returned to the bedroom and found Franklin lying in bed. Despite the temptation, Camila reflected on her recent decision to end her affair with Franklin and eventually decided to give it up. Franklin, she said without undressing, I think it's time to put an end to this. We had some good moments, but last night Max could see us in this position. We were lucky that it turned out to be a criminal. Let's get dressed and have breakfast somewhere. Franklin looked at her, wondered if it was worth arguing, but finally agreed with her arguments. Luck was on their side, but don't push your luck. Grinning, he remembered. Another attractive adult woman who frequented the car dealership. Okay, I agree. Let's get dressed. In the end, everything turned out to be more difficult than expected. Franklin was 50 pounds heavier and 4 inches taller than Max. After some adjustments, Camille managed to find a pair of old sweatpants that fit Franklin by making a V-shaped cut at the waist and tying the laces around it. She also found a pink hoodie that had been dyed in the washing machine, and after she cut off the sleeves and armholes, Franklin was fully dressed. She was about to say something about the clownish outfit, but instead only smiled slightly when she saw his face. They decided to pass the time watching TV until it was time to go to Franklin's. Max arrived at the address listed on Franklin's ID. It was a beautiful house with a bicycle leaning against the garage wall. Max sat in the car for a while, lost in his thoughts but still without tears. He spent the night at a motel and waited until dawn before going for a run. Contrary to his expectations, he did not feel as bad as he had assumed. Perhaps it was because he was still in shock. Going to the front door, he took out Franklin's wallet, which contained his driver's license. He rang the bell, and the door was opened by a young woman in her twenties, attractive but slightly disheveled. Max was wearing the suit he had bought in New York the day before, paired with a rumpled white shirt and no tie, although he didn't look the most presentable. He tried not to look threatening, showing the woman Franklin's driver's license and gesturing at the gold Mercedes. Before he could speak, she abruptly slammed the door in his face but immediately opened it again, holding a mobile phone in her hand. I will call the rescue service right now if you don't assure me that my husband is all right, she warned. I'm sorry, ma'am, he said. I have a photo on my phone of your husband and my wife in bed at night, both naked and fast asleep. To be honest, I don't think there are any offenses on my part. If you feel it is necessary to contact 911, please contact them, and I will wait in the car. Their eyes met for a moment, then her expression softened, and she motioned for him to come inside. As soon as she started talking, a voice came from the kitchen. 
Mommy, she excused herself, promising to return soon, and left the room. Max went to the kitchen where he believed he could hear the voices of her and at least one of the children. When she returned, she handed him a cup of black coffee. I hope you're drinking black coffee. I need to get the kids ready for school and then take them. I'm afraid I trust you more now than I do my husband. You can stay here until I get back, and then we'll talk, she said. Good, okay, Max replied. I think we're in the same boat. Max sat down in the living room, and soon a woman with two children came up to him. She introduced him as a friend of their father, after which she quickly left with the children. Max, sipping an ordinary coffee, thought about calling the office, but in the end, decided to leave everything as it is. Upon returning, the woman hurriedly climbed the stairs but reappeared a few minutes later, looking more composed with her hair styled and her lips tinted, holding out her hand. She introduced herself to Max, and they shook hands. I apologize for the recent outrage. I am Molly Thompson, married to Franklin Thompson, who is currently in a relationship with your wife. Max chuckled at her words and found solace in laughter. You are absolutely right. In the current situation, I am Max Tander, and my wife is Camille Tander. As he recounted the events of the previous night, he watched as tears welled up in Molly's eyes. I am ready to divorce Camille, and I believe that having these photos will help to reach a fair agreement. If you think you might need them, I can send them to your phone. Yes, I think I should have them, Molly replied, looking at Max without any emotion. He reached for the phone but hesitated when she spoke. Wait, please don't send them to me. If I see these photos, I'm afraid I'll never be able to forget them. You have to keep them, and if I need them, I can always come to you, right? Max reassured her, of course. Max noted that most likely he is not going to stay at his current job and in his house for a long time. He assured Molly that he would provide her with the contact information of his lawyer in case she needed a photo or help with a divorce. Molly expressed her gratitude and then asked about their current situation. She asked if Max planned to return the car or confront Franklin. She noted that Franklin was a strong man despite the fact that he had recently gained weight. Yesterday, he was supposed to come to Atlanta for a meeting by car and stay there overnight. He was supposed to come home this afternoon. I must admit I really like this car, but I've never driven a Mercedes before. Maybe I'll keep it until someone forces me to return it. Should I call him by his first name, or should it be a blockhead? Molly laughed, and Max joined her. They both needed to relax. For some tax reason, I think Franklin, or more correctly, this idiot put the car in my name since I drive more often than he does, Molly paused, deep in thought. Then she suggested, since the car is registered in my name I can give you permission to drive it. If you are ever stopped, the police will be able to contact me and clarify this, Max thought. Thought it was a great idea but didn't say anything, leaving Molly to discuss the details. And here's another thing, she added. There have been a lot of break-ins in our area lately. You have Franklin's keys and clothes, and if the key we hid in the backyard is missing by the time he arrives, he may try to break in the door. Then our security system will switch to instant alert mode, and this will attract unwanted police attention. Molly, I think I'm falling in love again. You're amazing. Relax, buddy. Franklin can wait to come back until the kids and I get back from school. Should I pick them up and take them to the park? That way, he'll have more time for trouble. Please keep me informed of all developments, especially if he has any problems with the authorities. Call me when you need to return the car to avoid problems. We're done now, it's time for both of us to leave. Max drove off in a stunning gold Mercedes, thinking about the cost of the same in a different color. Molly handed him a piece of paper with a permit, and he decided that she would also take care to set the alarm and hide the key before leaving for the whole day. Camille and Franklin drove up to his house around noon. Camille dropped him off and hurried away. Franklin went to the front door, hoping it wasn't locked because Molly was at home, but at the same time dreading the possibility of her presence. Unfortunately, the door was indeed locked. He was rushing around the yard in search of the stone that held the spare key, but to his horror, there was no stone. Cursing under his breath, he looked around the back of the house, wondering if it was worth trying to break down the door. When he tried to open the back door, he found that it was also locked, leaving no other options. He reluctantly decided to force his way in. After examining the windows along the back wall, he decided which one would be the most suitable for breaking in. Pausing at the bedroom window, he noticed that it was the largest window at the back of the house. 
By smashing it, he would have gained enough room to penetrate. Grabbing a branch from the tree, he carefully examined the window. Realizing that he was barefoot, he thought about how to safely get through the broken glass. Without hesitation, he brought two chairs from the back porch and placed them by the window, believing he could climb over the chairs and avoid the glass. Franklin took several deep breaths to prepare himself. He threw a branch at the bedroom window, and it shattered with a loud crash, but satisfaction quickly turned to horror when the home alarm siren wailed loudly. Unfortunately, it was at this moment that a police car drove down his street. Molly called the local police station in the morning to report possible break-ins in their area. Damn it, Franklin muttered, trying to navigate among the chairs and get to the house to turn off the security system, but he wasn't fast enough. Police. Stand still and move away from the house with your hands up, he heard from behind. Franklin turned around and saw two officers pointing pistols at him. He obeyed, carefully climbed down from the chairs, and walked away, getting off with only minor cuts on his legs. I can explain, he began, but one of the officers immediately took his hands behind his back and handcuffed him, ignoring his protests. The officer began to read out his rights before giving him the opportunity to speak out. Yes, yes, this is my house, he stammered. I didn't have a key, so I broke in to get my clothes and call the office. The police noticed Franklin's tracksuit, which they thought was clownish, and one of them asked him for an ID card. Franklin explained that he had lost. His car and belongings, needed to get into the house to change into suitable clothes. When asked how he lost the car, Franklin replied that he stayed the night at a friend's house and woke up to find that the car was gone. The officers asked if he had reported it missing or if he could have left it at the bar. Franklin found himself in a difficult situation. He didn't know how to explain his whereabouts or why he hadn't reported the car missing, but he definitely didn't want to end up behind bars for trying to break into his own house. The handcuffs dug into his wrists, adding to the discomfort. After thinking a little, he came up with a solution that could solve this problem. You could call my wife to confirm my identity, or maybe take me to my office, then I can ask a colleague for some spare clothes. Despite the possible troubles at work, this was a much more preferable option than imprisonment. After receiving Molly's phone number from Franklin, one of the policemen contacted her. Franklin listened to the conversation. The officer introduced himself to Riley from the Charlotte Police Department and said that they were at such and such an address. The officer explained that they had detained a man claiming to be Molly's husband who was trying to break into her house because he had lost his clothes. After a short conversation with Molly on the phone, the officer assured her that they would sort out the situation. After thanking Molly, the officer turned back to Franklin. The woman claimed that her husband was in Atlanta and believed that anyone who broke into her house was necessarily a burglar. She wanted them to go to jail. Franklin was on the verge of tears when the police escorted him to his car to take him to the station. Camille arrived at the office a few hours later, determined to make up for lost time. Worried about Max, from whom she had not heard, she tried to call him on his cell phone but received no response. After calling the office again, Camila expressed her concern to Sheila. She said she was worried about Max because she hadn't heard from him yet. Sheila assured her that there was no new information and suggested that Max might still be in New York with lawyers. Despite this, Camila found it unusual that Max did not call. Sheila promised to check on him and said that either he or she would call back soon. Camila thanked Sheila and praised her as the best secretary in the world. Soon after, Camila's phone rang, and she saw that it was Sheila calling. Camila, this is Sheila. I was talking to the secretary at the law office, and she mentioned that Max left late yesterday trying to catch the last flight to Charlotte. I called Max on his cell phone to find out how he was doing, and he asked me to tell you that he would call back later. Camila thanked Sheila and hung up, feeling anxiety creep into her stomach. After finishing his conversation with Sheila, Max drove his gold Mercedes to a meeting with a divorce lawyer who was recommended to him by Fred Thomas, his trusted business lawyer. When he arrived at the office, the secretary told him to sit down and informed him that Miss Reinhardt would be coming to see him soon. Max felt relieved when he settled into a chair in the lawyer's office. The setting was neither extravagant nor shabby, which gave him confidence in the professionalism of the company. Before he could think about it, a middle-aged woman with dyed red hair entered the waiting room. Mr. Trider, she asked, to which Max stood up and confirmed his identity. I'm Anna Reinhardt, she introduced herself. Fred mentioned you, and I'm here to provide you with the best possible level of protection. Let's go to my office and discuss your situation. 
Max followed her into a pleasant, if not extravagant, office where the secretary offered him coffee before telling him about her story. I found out that my wife is unfaithful. I want to get a divorce, and I'm trying to keep my assets, in particular, the profits from the sale of the company and business. Max omitted the part about the golden Mercedes, although he suspected that Anna would find it funny. Max, can I address you like this? she asked. He nodded, and she continued, I have encouraging news, relatively, given your circumstances, Anna informed me you and your sisters were the owners of your company before marrying your wife. As a result, your shares of the company are considered separate property. That means your wife has no rights to them and to profit from their sale. But it is important to make sure that the shares and the proceeds from their sale are kept separate from any joint accounts that you and your wife may have. Is that so? I think so, but what about assets like our home, retirement accounts, and other similar investments? Unfortunately, I have some hard news for you. Due to the higher salary compared to hers, you will be required to pay child support for several years to compensate for possible deductions from the retirement account. We may have to increase the amount of alimony. Although this situation may not be ideal, it is a necessary step to avoid possible financial difficulties in the future, such as the need to divide pension funds years later. Since your children are currently in college, alimony will no longer matter, but you may have to cover the remaining costs of their education. I hope this decision will suit you. What about the house? It is important for you and your wife to come to a decision. One option is to sell the house and split the profits, or one of you can buy it from the other based on the current appraised value. After last night, I'm sure I don't want to keep this house for myself. It is unlikely that Camila will be able to afford to buy out my share, so a sale may be the best option. I will quickly prepare the divorce papers, and I will be able to give them to you tomorrow. If you want, we can give it to her tomorrow afternoon. The proposed agreement can be reached as early as next week. It seems so fast. I. Max, please listen to me. Maybe a consultation or time will help you and your wife figure out the situation. No, it's just that it's all so unexpected for me. Less than a day ago, I was thrilled and looking forward to sharing the news about the sale of the company with my wife. After discussing the possibility of a divorce, Max realized that he had to move forward. He assured the lawyer that he would find a way out of the situation. If you change your mind, just call me, and we'll try to sort it out, she added. Max expressed his gratitude, paid, and left the office. As he walked back to the golden Mercedes, he couldn't help but think about the man he had bumped into the night before. This thought made him remember how he had promised his secretary to contact Camille. Camille picked up the phone in her office at the law firm where she worked and heard Max on the other end. Camille, this is Max. I saw that you called. Thanks for calling. Max, I missed you, Camille replied. Where are you? What's the matter? What is it? She asked. I'm in Charlotte, Camille. I came back last night, Max said. Hearing his words, Camille felt a knot in her stomach, and the metaphorical snake inside her stirred with worry. You came back last night, she repeated, and her tone became a little harsh. Camille leaned back in her chair, feeling the weight of the conversation weigh on her. It was hard for her to even catch her breath, let alone find the words to talk. Camille, I'm ending the conversation, Max announced in desperation. She protested, no, Max, please, no, she begged. Can we meet somewhere? I just need to see you, at least for a few minutes, Max paused, torn by the love he felt for this woman, the mother of his children, the most important woman in his life for over 20 years. Max made an appointment at the cafe center for 6 p.m. Memories flooded back to her when she remembered how they first met in this place. Despite her misgivings, she couldn't help but feel nostalgic for this place that held so many precious memories. As she prepared to leave, she couldn't help but wonder why Max had chosen this particular place. With a heavy heart, she dialed his number and whispered, Max, I'll see you there. Please listen to me. I'm very sorry, and I love you. Max hung up, and Camille was left wondering what was waiting for her in the cafe. Camille was sitting in the cafe, tears streaming down her face, and the snake of fear continued to bite her. She arrived early, expecting Max, who hadn't shown up yet. After ordering a glass of wine, she couldn't help but think about her past and what a terrible person she thought she was. Her first intimate encounters were with college football players who made her feel helpless, and this feeling remained from her school years when she had fun with them. 
When Max finally showed up, Camille hoped that she had managed to forget about her desire to feel helpless. Max was the perfect partner, a strong, loving, wonderful father to their girls, and a good breadwinner. He was all she needed, but everything changed during the flight to Charlotte from the West Coast. Max visited a pharmaceutical company to introduce a new drug, and she joined him for the weekend before the meeting started. During the night flight home, she found herself sitting next to a large man, the coach of the local NFL team, who started a conversation with Camille. They drank too much, and eventually, she fell asleep with her head on his shoulder. When she woke up, she realized that his hand was under her skirt. Remembering that night, Camille knew she should have screamed or pushed his hand away, but she didn't. Surprisingly, she didn't feel guilty about what had happened. Camille felt a surge of relief when Max returned only at the end of the week, giving her body time to recover. But at the same time, she couldn't get rid of the guilt lurking in her mind. The coach who worked at Charlotte for only one season unknowingly introduced her to a player from the training squad. Before leaving, this player, who wasn't a star or a rookie, wasn't as strong as the coach. Surprisingly, Camille was grateful for this new connection. After a while, the guilt she had been ignoring began to surface. She understood that she had to be faithful to Max and made the difficult decision to break up with her lover. Camille thought she was done with cheating when her daughters left for college. She treasured her relationship with Max and was glad that now they could be alone. But the temptation made itself felt again when Max presented her with a generous gift, a new luxury car to choose from. After driving to the Mercedes dealership, she crossed paths with Franklin Thompson. Although he didn't sell her the Mercedes, he managed to lure her into bed by pressing all the right buttons, and she knew perfectly well that this was morally wrong. Things were complicated by the fact that Franklin was not very skilled in bed. Despite the fact that she had gotten away with previous infidelities and considered her marriage indestructible, she deeply loved Max and wanted to remain faithful to him. She understood that doing the right thing meant not having an in-relationship with a less ideal partner. Allowing Franklin to spend the night in her marital bed was a very unfortunate decision, even before Max caught them. But she had let him, and now she was terrified of the consequences. Hi, Camille, Max's voice interrupted her thoughts. Camille looked up and saw that he looked older than when he left for New York and realized that it was her fault. The uneasy feeling in her stomach wouldn't leave her. Hi Max, thank you for coming, she replied. I can't even find the words to express how deeply sorry I am. Can I ask you a few questions, he asked, sitting down in an armchair. Max, please, let's not. Asking questions will only ruin all our chances. Max, maybe we should run away for a few days to some Caribbean island where we'll be together again, where we can hug each other. Camille, please, you're not thinking straight. If you can't answer my questions, I'll leave right now. Despite the fact that the snake of fear continued to bite, Camille understood that she needed to endure the pain and let Max vent his anger. Perhaps in this way, he will be able to come to reconciliation. Okay, Max, ask me anything, she said. Do you know what time I got home last night? His question seemed strange to her. No, not really, she replied, realizing that it must have been too late. She decided not to say anything, anticipating his next question. Do you know what I saw when I came home? When did I go upstairs to our bedroom, or should I say, into what used to be our bedroom? She knew exactly what Max was supposed to see, and she knew it was her fault. It must have been one of the most terrifying sights he had ever seen, and she begged him to listen to her. Max, I'm really sorry. I'm sorry, but I can't bring myself to agree to the divorce you want. If you want to talk, Camille, talk. Let's move on to the next question. How many men have you been with since we got married? If I suspect you're lying, I'll leave. Camille thought about lying at first, but eventually decided it was too dangerous. Then she realized that the marriage would most likely not be restored. 3. Max. Three men with whom I now regret that I ever crossed paths. I can see in your eyes that our marriage is coming to an end, and I accept it. You deserve someone who suits you better than me. I'm willing to do almost anything to try to save our relationship, but I'll also understand if you don't want to see me in your life anymore. Please, contact a lawyer, Camille. Tomorrow, you will receive the divorce papers, Max said, got up, and left. Camille sat there, too shocked to shed a tear. When she thought about Max's words, a feeling of horror arose inside her, and tears welled up in her eyes. Leaving the cafe, Max couldn't help but remember the day he first met Camille there so many years ago. 
As he walked, he had a feeling that this meeting might be their last chance for a meaningful conversation. The word intimacy left a bitter taste in his mouth when he recalled the painful revelation of his wife's infidelity. The image of her with Franklin, that vile toad, in their own bed made him boil with anger. How can he forget about this betrayal? Over two decades of living together, he overcame many difficulties with her, but cheating with three men was a blow for him from which he could not recover. The image of her infidelity in a shared bed meant the end of their marriage. As he sat in a luxurious gold Mercedes, the tears finally fell, marking the final breakup of their relationship. As the sun began to set, Max became aware of the impending darkness. He snorted, wiped away his tears, and thought about the conversation with Molly Thompson that had taken place that day. And now, it seemed to him that an eternity had passed. She asked him to refrain from sending her photos of her husband with Camille because, in her opinion, this would further complicate the process of forgiveness. Max made a mental note to discuss this with Molly as well as inquire about the situation with Mercedes. Taking a deep breath, he dialed her number. Hello, Molly's voice answered on the other end of the line. Molly, this is Max Tronder. I just wanted to find out how you're doing and discuss what to do with the car. Thanks for calling, Max. I'm fine. You can hold the car for now. Franklin is solving some problems, and he won't need her for a while. Problems. I hope you didn't hurt him. No, but I would like to. He was in trouble for trying to break into our house, and he even got into an altercation with a police officer. Given his size, the officer had to handcuff him. Something happened during his time in prison that he refuses to talk about, but I suspect that another prisoner may have attacked him. I tried to keep my distance from him. As a result, he called his brother to post bail, and his family found out about the situation. This is a difficult situation, Molly. I can't say that I sympathize with him, but I sympathize with you. I want to praise you for choosing not to look at the cheating photos this morning. It was the right decision. Coming to terms with these photos will be even more difficult. He returned home a few hours ago, full of tears and apologies, begging to stay. For now, with two small children, I will try to come to terms with it, but it will not be easy for him. His lawyer brother advised me to sign a prenuptial agreement and offered his help while I manage our finances. Franklin will have limited freedom, and I intend to keep a close eye on him. Keep up the good work, Molly. I wish you all the best. Just call me when you need to return the car. After hanging up the phone, Max sat down and felt a pang of jealousy for Molly. Maybe Franklin finally learned his lesson after he was arrested and charged with assault for trying to hit a police officer. In addition to the difficulties he faced in prison, he may have been badly scarred. Max hoped so. Thinking of Molly and their children back at the motel, he realized that before he went to rest, he had one last thing to do, call his daughters, Jane and Joan. As soon as Jane picked up the phone and greeted him with a joyful hello daddy, he couldn't help but notice how similar their voices were. Although they were twins, they were not identical but could have been if their voices had been so similar. They both study nursing at an expensive college, and Max couldn't help but be proud of his girls. Despite the strong resemblance, they were not identical twins, much to Max's relief. He often secretly confessed that he was glad that they were not copies of each other. They could unite against him, and he could not imagine how two identical young women would pressure him to make a decision, for example, about buying a car, night parties, or financing a trip to Florida for spring break. No matter what their last request was, it always ended with a plea, Daddy, please. Although he didn't admit it openly, deep down, he knew that he liked to pamper them. Jane, how's Dad doing? How about joining my sister and me for brunch tomorrow? let's say around 11 a.m. at a bistro on 4th Street. I think it's not bad. Wait a minute, he heard a noise in the background. When she returned, Joan was there too. Can we talk? She cut him off abruptly, remembering their friends at brunch. Let's talk about the three of us, okay? Jane agreed, but before she could finish, he stopped her, avoiding a phone conversation, which was difficult even in person. I have to go. See you at 11 o'clock. I love you, and please tell your sister that I love her too. Goodbye. With that, he ended the conversation. He prayed that she wouldn't contact Camille, but he couldn't bring himself to say so. If he had, she would undoubtedly have contacted Camille right away. The meeting at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning was rapidly approaching. 
After Max left the cafe, leaving her with ominous advice to go to a lawyer, Camille could hardly hold back tears. She knew perfectly well what she had done and ruined everything. She understood that her marriage, her family, her whole life was at stake. The thought of her daughters, parents, and friends finding out about it terrified her. She was afraid of losing Max, the house, and everything. That was dear to her, the thought of Max finding her naked in bed with Franklin haunted her, and Syl's tears flowed uncontrollably. Eventually, a waitress came up to her and offered to take her to the bathroom. Camila held back tears and politely refused. Afterward, she paid the bill and went to the house, which would soon cease to be her refuge. Upon arrival, she found a bottle of gin, but it was enough to cloud her thoughts, giving no clarity on how to get Max back. After drinking the whole bottle, she fell asleep, not losing hope for a wonderful reunion with Max. At eleven o'clock the next morning, Max was sitting in the bistro when his daughters entered the hall. Earlier that day, he had carefully reviewed and approved the draft divorce application. After driving two hours from Charlotte, he used that time to think about how to approach the conversation with Jane and Joan. When they entered the bistro, the usual pleasant events took place, hugs, kisses, questions about school and work. They ordered food, ate, cleared the plates, and finally, the moment came when they could start a real conversation. We feel that something is wrong, Joan began. You don't look well. Are you going to tell us that you have cancer or some other disease? And if so, where is mom? Girls, I have serious news, but they are not related to health. No one is in danger of death, and it's about mom. Oh no, did she do something terrible? Joan exclaimed. Did she run off with one of her colleagues, leaving us in pursuit of a young fit body? The sisters couldn't help but laugh at the absurdity of the situation. At first, this idea seemed absurd, but the girls were stunned when they realized that their father was serious. Their mother cheated on him, but he insisted that didn't mean she cheated on them, Joan couldn't believe what she was hearing. Through tears, she agreed with her father, realizing that because of her mother's act, their family was being torn apart. Both girls were overcome with emotion when they learned this bitter truth. Max started crying too. The girls stood up and tried to hug their father and each other at the same time. Dad, let's go, Jane suggested. There's a park two blocks away where we can get some privacy. Feeling the stares of others on him, Max quickly paid, and they headed to the park with the girls walking on either side of him, holding hands. As soon as they found a bench to sit on, Jane spoke up. Tell us, Dad. We deserve to know the truth, no matter how difficult it is, Joan said, joining the conversation. We're all old enough to handle this. Max nodded in agreement and added, it was hard for me to find the right words on the way here. Both Joan and Max acknowledged the painful reality that their mother had betrayed them all. Max said that his mother was with another man in their bed and admitted that she had cheated with others before him. There was shock in his voice when he admitted that he did not see a way to survive this betrayal. I have already consulted with a divorce lawyer, and today mom will receive a divorce application, tears flowed, and then there was a heavy silence as they all pondered the news and what it meant for their future. Girls, no matter what happens, remember that your priority should be yourself and your college studies, he advised. I have enough funds to pay for your senior year at Duke, and if you decide to continue your graduate studies, I will do my best to provide financial support in this as well. But my offer has one condition. The girls stared at him, waiting for his terms. What did he want to say? In his own words, I am ready to financially support your education. But I want to see how you put in the effort and get good grades. I understand that your mother's actions are preventing you from focusing on your studies, but you both assured me that as adults, you are able to overcome such obstacles with maturity and discipline. They exchanged glances, shed tears again, and hugged him. Yes, yes, Dad, we appreciate your support and promise not to disappoint you, Joan offered words of encouragement while Jane was lost in thought. Dad, Joan is right, we will not disappoint you, but what about you? Are you going to be okay? What are your plans? The father paused, thinking about what was bothering them. You can think about a lot in two hours of driving, he began. First of all, I want you both to know that your words do not surprise me. I have no doubt that you will succeed in school, and I will always be proud of you. As for me, your mother's actions had a great influence on me. I could step aside and wallow in self-pity, trying to make peace with your mother, but I realize that I'm not that kind of person. My life has been dedicated to taking care of others. 
I took care of my grandparents first, then my sisters when they inherited the shares, and of course, my own mother and you girls. It may seem like a complaint, but it's not. The upcoming sale of the company will soon free me from the burden of caring for my sisters. Camille has already left me. I assure you all that I am ready to support and guide you as you enter adulthood. Considering that two out of three women in my life are lucky, I consider myself very lucky. Now it's only my merit. But instead of perceiving betrayal and divorce as the worst events in my life, I see them as an opportunity to start all over again, dedicate a new chapter of your life to taking care of one person, yourself. But Dad, Joan expressed her support, if you really think so, that's great. Jane, however, was more questioning. Dad, what does all this mean, a new life? What does it mean? R. You thinking about a new job at a pharmaceutical company or maybe buying a farm? This is a reasonable question, and I have a satisfactory answer to it. I don't know all the details yet, but this new chapter of my life will be devoted to physical activity. I plan to run marathons, conquer mountains, swim across the Atlantic, conquer the Alps, and go on safari. The list of things I want to do is endless, and you know what? Along the way, I can meet a wonderful woman who will share my spirit of adventurism. Who knows what the future holds for me? This, Dad, is just incredible. Both girls stared at him in disbelief. It was their father, not some fearless adventurer. Did you really come up with all this while driving here from Charlotte? Jane asked. Well, yes, partly, he replied, but I also didn't sleep much, and different ideas were spinning in my head. I could have drowned my grief in alcohol, but instead decided to make the most of the situation. Believe me, I'll be fine. Max said goodbye to his daughters, hugged them, kissed them, shed tears, and drove back to Charlotte in a gold Mercedes. As soon as he drove away, the girls dialed their mother's number. A tired voice answered the call at the Tronder house. Joan turned on the speakerphone and informed her mother, Mom, this is Joan and Jane. We just had breakfast with Dad, and he shared some unpleasant news with us. The mother asked curiously, and what did he say? The word divorce hung in the air, casting a shadow over the conversation. The reason for all this was your betrayal. Father gave us some more information, but that's the gist of it. It's true. Oh girls, it's hard. Your father and I have been married for so long, and this is a mistake. Yes, I made a big mistake, actually more than once. But I believe we can handle it. I just need to give your father some time, Mom Joan interrupted. Listen up when Dad talked about the divorce, he didn't mention trying to fix the relationship. Technically, he's right, but that doesn't mean we can't try to fix it. I promise to do whatever it takes, Mom Jane interjected, expressing her doubts. Dad mentioned consulting with a divorce lawyer and said that there is no way back for both of you. Joan and I want to remain neutral, but you need to face the truth. Joan and Jane exchanged worried glances, and the room was filled with the sounds of agonized breathing. Should they have come to Charlotte after all? Finally, Camille's voice broke the silence, barely above a whisper. I know that I ruined everything and ruined my marriage. Your father probably hates me, and he's right. I've done some terrible things. He advised me to find a lawyer, and he was right about that too. I'm really sorry, girls. I know it's hard for you too, Mom. Don't worry about us, Joan reassured her. Everything will be fine, and I believe that Dad will do his best. Don't forget about yourself. Hiring a lawyer is a wise decision if necessary. Jane and I can come to Charlotte. Thanks, girls. I appreciate it. I'll be fine. I just need time to realize what I've done. They ended the conversation. The girls still didn't know what to do. You know, Joan said, it's ironic though not funny that we're more worried about mom, who caused all this chaos, than about dad. After much discussion, they decided not to return home, leaving their parents to deal with the situation without their participation. Camila stayed in the house, feeling a little awkward because of the gin she had drunk the day before and feeling discouraged after talking to her daughters. Realizing that she needed to unwind, Camila thought about packing up and leaving the house. Just as she was wondering if she should buy more gin, the doorbell suddenly rang, forcing Camille to open. The door. There was a woman standing in the doorway who looked like she was chewing gum. How can I help you? Camille asked. Yes, ma'am, are you Camilla Treyer, Max Chirk's wife? The woman asked. Yes, that's right. May I ask who you are? Camilla replied. 
Ma'am, you've been served, the woman said, handing Camille a folder of documents and taking photos. Camille exclaimed when the woman returned to her car. Back at the house, Camille sat down at the kitchen table to study the mysterious folder. At the sight of the title of the first document, she almost fainted, a petition for divorce. The words Max had said to her earlier echoed in her head, find a lawyer. Looking around the kitchen she once shared with Max, she realized that the joyful moments they spent together would never be returned only because of her betrayal. Camille's intuition turned out to be correct, she and Max could not save their marriage. Six years later, Camila found herself in the ballroom of a luxury hotel, watching Jane spin around the dance floor with her husband. Memories of her teenage years flashed through Camila's mind when life seemed unbearable to her. There were too many activities, too many teen dramas, and boys who, in her opinion, were either too violent or too kind. Max was busy working as an assistant, and the profession of a lawyer seemed boring to Camille. Life had seemed suffocating to her then, but now she longed for those times. Camille was still working at her usual law firm, immersed in a routine of monotonous paperwork. While she was daydreaming, her colleague, a good-natured middle-aged lawyer with thinning hair, handed her a glass of wine. Camille, here's your wine, he said. Camila looked at him gratefully, remembering that he had accompanied her to Jane's wedding. All these years she remained unhappy, still madly in love with Max, but she understood that he could not be returned. She had never met a man she could love, all the men she met on her way after the divorce either wanted intimacy from her or were terrible people. It happened that Camilla indulged in intimate pleasures with unfamiliar men, which she later greatly regretted. Some of them were married, someone disappeared after the first date, and someone infected her with psychiatric diseases. Remembering all this, tears flowed from her eyes as she looked lovingly at her ex-husband. The bride looks great, just like her mother, said a colleague of Camilla, whom she asked to accompany her to her daughter's wedding. Thank you, Carl, you're so caring, and thanks for the wine, her gaze kept stopping at Max, who had recently returned from a climbing expedition in Nepal. Camilla couldn't help but admire the fact that, with his tanned skin and flawless physique, he resembled a bronze statue of a Greek god. He looked even more attractive than she could have imagined. Now, he was chatting animatedly with Joan and her partner, holding the hand of a woman who was as stunning and fit as himself. Joan informed Camilla that Max had met this woman during a previous mountaineering expedition in South America, and for several months, they had been traveling, swimming, and climbing together. Camilla felt sick at the thought. Camilla, Carl called to her. Yes, Carl. Camilla replied. I think it's time for us to leave. You fulfilled your role as the mother of the bride, and you don't need to stay fixated on your ex-husband. I have to say, it's probably true. You are right in your conclusions and very kind. I'll say goodbye to my daughters, and we'll hit the road, Camilla said, hugged, and kissed her daughters, wishing the newly married couple all the best and trying not to notice Max and his charming girlfriend. Max watched Camilla leave the hall and felt a twinge of sadness for their past together as he watched her go. Joan interrupted him with a question, Dad, do you remember that gorgeous gold Mercedes you drove when Jane and I had breakfast at Duke? What happened to this car? Oh, Joan, it's a long story that I won't go into. Let's just say I borrowed it from a friend and eventually returned it to her. I think she sold it. It was definitely hers, damn car. Max then turned to his girlfriend to discuss their upcoming trip to the mountains. Returning to her desolate apartment, Camilla found herself unable to find solace. Overwhelmed by hysterical episodes, she grappled with the disbelief of shattering her once blissful marriage and her entire existence. A week elapsed with no reprieve to her deteriorating health, teetering on the brink of collapse. Camilla's cognitive faculties seemed clouded, harboring a desire to escape the torment suffusing her being. Consequently, two days later, her absence from work prompted concern among colleagues. Carl eventually escorted her home after she took sick leave, only to find her in a pitiable state, her countenance marred by tears. Curled up in a corner of her bedroom, she swayed gently, muttering softly to herself. Subsequent diagnosis at the clinic revealed a profound mental affliction, Camilla had plunged into the depths of depression. Presently, she undergoes treatment in a psychiatric facility under vigilant medical supervision. At what juncture did Camilla's life veer off course? Was it when she first betrayed Max, or when he discovered her entwined with her lover in their shared bed? Even Camilla couldn't discern the precise moment, 